Thank you, Brother Woody. Good evening, everyone. It's really good to see you. It's so nice to spend some time in prayer with all of you. So, on Wednesday nights, for a long time, for almost two years, we have been looking at different prayers in the Bible. We started with the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew chapter 6, and we have gone from A to Z, from the front to the back, looking at different prayers. We have, while we've looked at those prayers, learned things about how to pray, but we've learned a whole lot more. I've explored broadly around those texts so that we've learned things about the nature of God, we've learned things about people, we've learned things about how to pray, we've learned things about the Bible. We've learned what I call biblical literacy, understanding the Bible. And it is my conviction that it's very important. It's an important topic for us to think about and learn and study because the Scripture says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. There's a wonderful story about some time ago in a SBC meeting where there was a little kind of back and forth between the president of the National WU and at that time the president of the Southern Baptist Convention and they were using different texts to kind of tease one another from the platform and taking the text and bending them just a little bit to make them say something that they didn't really intend to say that the scripture didn't really intend to say and the president had said something to her and, and it was all in very good fun but her response back to him was I would not have you ignorant brethren instead of I would not have you I would not have you ignorant brethren I would not have you ignorant brethren so well anyway you want to say that little phrase we don't want to be ignorant brethren and sistren so I have to confess that these kind of topics are fun for me and perhaps because they are I belabor them and you sit there and you know wear out the pew cushion <laughs> saying okay get done with this would you but when we get finished we are going to be well schooled it's going to be like as though you went off to the seminary and you took biblical backgrounds 101 because that's what you're that's kind of some of what we're getting but when we get finished with it some of you will have a better grasp on some pieces that you just need to know and understand at, at least that's my conviction and I'm ready to sit down with anybody who would like to talk further about it and kind of find our way through it if we can. But so the long and the short of it is you can take, uh, for example, the King James Version Bible, and you can take a modern English translation, lay them side by side, and in some places you're going to find a word here that's not here. And some people are going to say, well, they didn't like that, so they took it out. So don't use that one. And other people are going to say, well, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. They're going to say, well, let me tell you how that happens, how that has happened. And I want to back up just a little bit because I, probably a foundation piece that I should have laid a little bit earlier is this one. And I'm going to read, I'm going to read the Lord's Prayer again for us for a minute and then try to wrap up this discussion. But a great many... Christians, especially those who would think about themselves as evangelical or, or conservative Christians, are very comfortable talking about the Bible in terms of being inerrant. I too am comfortable about talking, talking about the Bible in, in that way. But when, when Bible teachers say, when they use that phrase, when they say we have an inerrant scripture, they are meaning, they are meaning inerrant in the sense of the Chicago Statement of Inerrancy. And that sounds like fun, doesn't it? You can Google it if you like. A group of very conservative scholars got together in Chicago, of all places, and they thought about, well, when we say the Bible is inerrant, what do we mean? And so they wrote a rather lengthy document, and it said things like, well, when we say this phrase, we mean this, but we don't mean this. And we mean this, and we don't mean this. And they, and they made some, they posited some statements about the Scripture. 
And the bottom line is, they said when the original writer sat down and wrote this letter or this gospel or one of the Old Testament books or the Revelation or the history, the book of Acts, when a, a, the original writer sat down and he wrote that thing out, what they call the autograph, the first copy came off, the pen of the first writer was without error in any way. It was exactly what God wanted there. Now, there is nobody who holds to the Chicago Statement of Inerrancy who will say what the original writer wrote on that original piece of paper or papyrus or animal skin, what he wrote, that 2,000 years later we have precisely and exactly the thing that he wrote when he first wrote it down. And that's scary for some people, and it's disturbing for some people, but it wasn't disturbing for any of the scholars who signed the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy because they had to deal with the reality of the fact, as do we, that you can take Greek copies of the New Testament, of which we have some 6,000 full copies or partial copies, and you can lay them side by side, and you can see that there are some words that are in this one that aren't in this one. And they will say, yes, we acknowledge that it is possible for humans to get into the process and to do some things that made it look like that. And they will say, and I will agree, that if you could back up to what the first guy wrote, when Paul sat there and he wrote, or actually he probably had a secretary that wrote as he dictated, you know, he gets to the end of the Galatians and he says, see how big I'm signing this thing with my own hand? Well, somebody else wrote it down for him, but when that first thing was written, that was what we could comfortably say, inerrant. Now, here is what modern scholarship around the Bible is trying to do. And when I say modern scholarship, what I mean is some very dedicated people who love the Lord Jesus who know Him as their Savior and Lord, sit down with these 6,000 pieces of manuscript and they try to understand it. And they have one goal in mind. And that one goal in mind is to get as close as they can to what the original author wrote. That's the goal. The goal is not to take out something you don't like. The goal is not to keep something that you do like if it looks like it didn't belong there in the very beginning. The goal is to get as very close as you can to what the original author wrote. And so all of that is kind of new information for a lot of people and it's something you kind of have to process and think about. But I would like to tell you as your pastor who loves you and wants you to love the Word that we have to know these things so that we can understand how we end up with the Scripture that we end up with. So I think I've made it clear to you that the King James Version that I love and memorize and still can quote many places and still use. It was made, it was a translation made in part from the Latin Vulgate, but it, it had Erasmus of Rotterdam, that 16th century scholar who did the very first printed Greek New Testament, they had his New Testament in front of them. And that New Testament that Erasmus of Rotterdam printed in the 16th century was based upon five or six Greek manuscripts, all of which were around the 12th century. That's when they were first copied. And so over these years, we have discovered more and more and more and more and more in all kinds of various places. Now, I think I'm going to be able to show you a picture. Do we have it, Kim? Doesn't that look like fun? Can you see it? Well, I mentioned last, last week that in 1844, a man by the name of Tischendorf, aren't you glad that's not your name? It's hard to spell. He was a Bible scholar and a collector of old Bibles, and I don't know how he ended up in the monastery on St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai the traditional place where Moses got the law. There's, a, there's a, one of the oldest monasteries in the world is right there on the side of that mountain. If you go to, with me to Israel next year, there's a possibility we'll go see that place and climb that mountain and watch the sun come up. That's just a little advertisement. 
So he was there in 18... I'm sorry, am I? And everybody that loves the pew cushions. So he was there in 1844, and some of the monks showed him these very, very old pieces of animal skin, parchment, that had old writing on it. And he ended up getting a few copies of that and eventually a whole bunch of the, cop a whole bunch of the pages. And in recent years... Those pages, those pages are now in four different locations. In recent years, those four different locations have agreed and allowed all the pages to be photographed and it to be printed in an exact facsimile of the original Sinaitic, Codex Sinaiticus from the 4th century, about, three, about 350 A.D. And this is part of it. This is just a little sample out of it. The reason I wanted to show it to you is it'll maybe in part help you understand why it's kind of so... If you're interested in looking at this, go to Google, Codex Sinaiticus, and you can open the manuscript and you can look at it right online, every page. Some of the pages are just, are not complete. A lot of them are complete. This is one of the columns on one of the pages. There are, four, there are three columns, I think, three or four columns on every page. Just for fun, right, let's see here, is where John 3.16 starts. It looks like an O, Y, who knows what, W, C, who knows what, kind of an A, a P. Well, the, none of that is how that's pronounced. But that's where it starts. Thus, for he so loved, namely, God, the world, etc. But look how the, they're all capital letters, and there's no space between the words. You see that looks like a C? Well, it's really an S. And that that looks like who knows what, that's really a G. And this is the end of one word, and that's the beginning of the next word. And you get down to the end of the line, and it just cuts. It doesn't stop the word. The word just wraps around and then continues on on the next line, and that's how it goes. Word after word after word, line after line after line. It's pretty hard to read. It's pretty hard to read. And it might show you why it could be kind of easy for a small little error to slip in there or a small little difference to slip in there. And so here are these scholars with these 6,000 manuscripts or pieces of manuscript in front of them. And they studied them so very diligently and it's possible, it's possible to kind of date when they were made, even though nobody wrote a date on it. And the way that it's kind of possible is they didn't write them, they didn't write like this all the time. Later on, they started using capital letters and little letters, and they started putting some punctuation in there. And the way the letters were actually drawn, see, I, I showed you one there, it looks sort of like a C. Well, that's an S, but... A couple hundred years later, they started making that S completely different. Didn't look like that anymore at all. And so scholars are able to look at that and say, well, the way, this is the way they wrote in the 3rd or the 4th century. And by about the 8th century or the 9th century, they were making letters differently. That's no different from modern English. I mean, you get a real King James Bible and you look at it, and all those little things that look like Fs, they're really Ss. You've, most of you have seen that. And so language shifts and changes like that. So these scholars can kind of see pretty close like a dating, and sometimes they have ways of testing the paper or the animal skin to put a kind of a date on it. So they can say this is, these are the oldest, and then these are over time up until about the 12th, 13th, 13th 14th century. And a very interesting thing starts to develop. that They can start to recognize... Well, in this one, this word was like this, but in this one, the word was different. And from there on out, it had that new word in there or that different spelling. So they can sort of see where those differences kind of slipped in. What that kind of leads to, as well as other things, is that today, 
when you read a modern English translation, like the New American Standard or the New International Version or the CEV or the Southern Baptist Version, which is the Christian Standard Version. I mean, we go right to the heart of it. This is the Christian Standard Version. That's the one Southern Baptists have printed. And it's an excellent version, too. It's an excellent translation. When you read those, every one of them is based on a modern Greek text. What these scholars have worked it diligently with one goal in mind to get as close as they can to what the original writer wrote. And they have some things that kind of help them make those decisions. If you've got different, different wordings, well, which one is the closest to the original? And some rules that they have developed that, that are pretty interesting. For example, it tends to be the older the manuscript, the closer it is in wording to the very first. That just makes sense. It doesn't seem to always work out that way, but it seems to make sense. Another one of the rules is sometimes if more and more of the Bibles have it worded this way, perhaps you should trust that more as being the original wording. So sometimes that's one of the rules. This is a really interesting one. If you have two different, if you have this manuscript and this manuscript, and they're not, I've almost painted a bad picture for you. Never is there any like, this one says, Old MacDonald had a farm, and this one says, eeny, meeny, miny, mo." It's never anything like that. It's, it's like, Old MacDonald had a farm, and this one says, Old MacDonald had an old farm. It's that kind of little differences, okay? But so another one of the rules that helps them to decide which one is closer to the original is if you have two of them, and this one is kind of hard to understand, but this one, the wording is more easy to understand, the harder to understand is probably the one that's closer to the original. Because over time, people making copies would say, what does that mean? I think I know. And so that's the way they wrote it. So those kind of rules and other things, and they have a whole bunch. It's not one person or two persons. There's a bunch of these scholars that are working to do their diligence to see how close can we get to the original Scripture. And so they work on these things, and they, they come to an agreement enough that we can print the thing. And so modern English translations are all based upon what is called a critical Greek text. Critical, not as in we criticized it, but in that we looked at all those 6,000 of them and we did our diligence to do the very best that we could to find what was closest to the original author's writing. That's the whole goal. And so 99% of the time, it's going to look just like King James. And 1% of the time, it's going to be a little bit different. And one of those differences shows up right here in the Lord's Prayer. 13b, verse 13, the last part of it, is not in some of the oldest manuscripts that we have. It is not in Codex Sinaiticus. That last part, 13b, is not in Codex Sinaiticus. So, how did it get there? We don't know exactly. Nobody can put their finger on it and say, well, this is how it got there. It's not in any of the oldest manuscripts. It's not in any of the oldest translations of the oldest manuscripts. And what I mean by that is that we translate into English, the Greek into English. But some time ago, Martin Luther translated the Greek into German. That was in the 16th century. Before that, there were others who did translations way back, way back. So there is a very old Latin translation. There's a very old Syriatic translation. There's a very old, some of the other Coptic translations that were made like in the second or the third century. And those older translations don't have the last part of verse 13 in them which would indicate that what they translated from did not have the last part of 13. Isn't this fun? Oh, I can just see you guys are just saying, Oh, more, bring on more. Okay, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. The first time that that wording shows up, it's not in a translation of the Bible, but it is in a very ancient Christian document. In the 2nd century, somebody 
wrote sort of like a church manual that we call, this is a great word, the didahi. Isn't that fun? The didahi. It's a second century writing that has some information about how churches can do church, so to speak. And in the Lord's Prayer part, in that writing called the didahi, it's got the wording of the blessing right at the end. You know, uh, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It takes out one or two of those words, but it has most of it in there. So the blessing, this little part from 13b is very ancient. It just wasn't in any of the manuscripts. It started showing up pretty regularly around the 7th or the 8th or the 9th century, and, and pretty much from there on out, it showed up in all of the ancient manus uh, manuscripts from that point on. There is a very similar wording to that at the end of the Lord's Prayer in 1 Chronicles. Take a look at it for a minute. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Verse 11. So this is David's prayer. David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and forever. Here's verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Now, that's not exactly the same wording, but what you see there is a very common practice in Jewish prayers. Jewish prayers that we find in many different places, not necessarily in the Bible, but in, in Jewish worship books and various things, almost all of them have a similar blessing at the end of it. So this is just speculation, but speculation by some Bible teachers is that here was the Lord's Prayer, and people in their worship time knew, you know, they were in their churches, in those early, that ancient church, the second and third century, and they knew what Jesus had taught, and they knew the blessings that were in Chronicles and that were in other kind of prayers. And so they said the words that Jesus had taught to say, and they, they added that blessing from Chronicles and kind of modified it a little bit or from a Jewish blessing somewhere and put it in there. And then over time, somebody knew that blessing that a lot of people said inside of their churches as they prayed and wrote it maybe in the margin of one of the Greek texts, and so eventually it made its way in. I know that all of that can be disturbing that I have said to you. Here's some of my concluding thoughts, and then I'll read the text for us. Somehow or another, God allowed that to get into the text. That's just a faith statement that I make. It violates nothing in all of Scripture. It is perfectly theologically sound. It is a prayer that many Christians have said and read and used in worship for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It is so good theologically and poetically that even now, when many Bible-translating teams know that this was not what Matthew wrote when he first wrote Matthew, that they, they say, ah, but it's there in many, and it's known by the church, and it's theologically sound, so brilliant and wonderful and godly scholars who try to work on translations, many of them say, we need to put, leave it there. And so the New American Standard Bible's got it. It's got it a little note. It's got a footnote. And many of your other Bibles will have it as a footnote to say, you know, this is in, in older English Bibles, and it is worthy of using in a prayer. And I would have no doubt, but what since Jesus was Jewish himself and knew the tradition of saying prayers that included a blessing at the end, that many, many, many times when he would have prayed with his disciples, he would have said prayers that would have included blessings very much like that. 
I don't know if that helps anybody. For me, it says, hey, that's good. That's good. It's still a worthy piece for us to put into our worship and into our memory and into our songs. But I will know, I will know in biblical literacy that there's a very, very, very small chance that Matthew wrote it in the very first copy that he wrote of this gospel. It doesn't hurt anything. It's theologically sound. It's worshipful. So I have no problem saying it, praying it, and explaining it. So I've said all of that stuff, all of that stuff, to read the text and then to say one or two final words about actually that wording. So here's the prayer again. You've heard it so many times. You know it. Jesus says, pray then in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses or debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then the blessing. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so the words mean something that you already know and understand without any doubt. You know when it says, for yours is the kingdom, that that is an accurate statement. The kingdom that Jesus proclaimed, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that He came to proclaim and to inaugurate is not our kingdom. It is God's kingdom. And if we ever get that confused, we have lost touch with our head. It is His reign. He rules. He rules in our hearts. He rules in this congregation. He rules in His church everywhere. And in fact, He is the ultimate ruler of the universe. So, we have no problem with that phrase, do we? Thine is the kingdom. And then we say, and the power. Well, there's no problem with that phrase. That's absolutely theologically accurate. For all power is His. We've talked about it from so many different vantage points to try to describe the power of God. It is the power that can be easily sort of, well, maybe not easily visualized, but you can think that there was nothing there was nothing. And God said, let there be light. Bam! And there was light. And then God said, let the waters be separated from the waters. And they were. And let the dry ground come out. And let there be birds and fish and animals. And let there be people. And bang and bang and bang. And so the whole broad expanse of the universe that is un." knowable in its hugeness you can't begin to imagine the expanse of the creation of God in a flash and there it was there is no power that comes any place even close I mean not I mean it's like saying well here's an ant and here's an ox what can an ant do compared to an ox here, Mr. Ant, I'm going to hook a plow up to you. Let's see what you can do. Well, I can't even get a strap that's small enough to get around that guy. And, and, and even that, as silly as that is, that can't even begin to come close. It can't even begin to come close to just in the power of the creation. But the greatest power we know is demonstrated in God, not in the creation of the universe, but when he took that which was dead and made it alive. And that's what he did in Christ Jesus. And through Christ Jesus, he is making a new people that he takes from death to life. He's not turning over new leaves for us. He's not flipping the calendar over. He is taking dead people and making them alive. That's power. I believe it is. So the phrase in the prayer is absolutely accurate. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And we've talked many times about glory to try to find out somehow what all does that mean. And it's more of a feeling than it's a definition. I can work words around that all that I want to. 
and none of them quite get to the heart of the matter. But when I say glory, or you experience glory, you start to get a taste of it. It is way beyond us. It is the majesty and the greatness and the... and I don't have a word. I just can't come up with a word. It's beyond what I can describe. Somehow or another, you've got to get in touch with it. And when you take Jesus into your life and the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell in you and He starts remaking your life and putting you on a new path and your, your goal and your vision for how you live has become completely different. It's no longer about me, it's about Him. You start to see all around you evidences of the glory of God. And if all of those words don't make sense, well, you just keep pressing forward. One of these days He's going to show it to you. And so thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory and it's not for a little while it's forever and many of the many of the manuscripts have forever twice forever and forever <laughs> forever and forever the word that that in greek means forever is the word age age and it doesn't mean how old you are i'm of a certain age and you're of a certain age the hebrew had in mind that there were spans of time. There were like ages of time. And that translates over to, for us too. We understand what we mean when we talk about, well, you know, it was, it, was, it, was the, yeah. it was the dark ages or it was the industrial age or some other kind of age. We know that means a, a long period of time. Well, the Hebrew had in mind that there was the present age and the age to come. And in their mind, the present age went on for this whole distance. And the age to come went on even more. And so whenever they wanted to say something that was very, very, very long, the word they used was age. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory unto the ages. For if there's this age and there's the future age, if there is any age beyond the future age, it is... A number that's unfathomable. It's a distance that I can't even imagine. And so the kingdom is His and the power is His and the glory is His, not for a little while, not for the distance of time that you can begin to imagine, but to the ages of the ages. There ain't no end. To say it in the vernacular. And then, you know, you wrap it up with that one little word, that lot, little tiny word, that one little Hebrew word that has now become a word in almost every language in the world. Amen. It means, it doesn't mean the end. I've got to the end of my prayer. Amen. See, there's the period. Amen. It's the period. No, amen means I agree. May it be so. This is the truth. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and forever. Yes, that's the truth. I stake my life on it. So, who said that a critical Greek text couldn't make you excited? <laughs> so that's it, brothers and sisters. We've been all over the Bible through all kinds of prayers. I don't know what I'm going to do next Wednesday. I might try to do some summary where I go back and pick stuff out of all those prayers that we've looked at or might press into a new thing. I'll figure it out before next Wednesday. But you're invited to come back and join us. Now we're going to go sing forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> and they're pretty good country western songs. It's just forever and ever, amen, or something like that. My country and western is not all that good. Power. All right. That's from Liz. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Great. Praise God. <laughs> Let's close with a quick prayer. 
and then we'll go sing, many of us. Lord God, Your Word, Your Word, Your Word. We love it. We cherish it. It speaks to us. It changes us because it is an instrument in Your hands for new life. Thank You for these words that Jesus gave us so long ago and that still, that still take us to You when we say them and when we pray them. We love those words because they help us to love You. Take us from this place that we may serve You in this community. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right.